Hello and welcome to The Goggle, where we challenge and, if necessary, destroy media narratives. All right, the, the issue of Russia, uh, Russia-U.S. relations is again on the agenda, or the lack of them, um, and it, it, it seems to be persistent in this campaign. But we've had, over the last week or so, a lot of um, uh, prominent foreign policy people, I still think of a lot of them as swamp people, uh, saying that there is a necessity, and I'll even go to the article that was put in the American Conservative, uh, U.S.-Russia relations in need of emergency resuscitation stacked. Okay, to discuss this and more, we have Glenn Deason. He is a professor and writer and commentator. We also have George Samueli. He is a co-founder of this uh, YouTube channel and a commentator in his own right. Let me go to George first. The, uh, this article that was written by Mr. Larson over at the, the, uh, the American Conservative is, is spot on, but it's been spot on for a long time, George, and the needle just can't be moved because this is nominally a foreign policy issue, but more than ever, it is a domestic policy issue. Until you can resolve that in domestic politics, there's no way in the world you can move uh, the needle on foreign policy on the same topic. So it's kind of, you know, this is this classical one step forward, two step back. And if you keep doing one step forward, two steps back, you keep going further and further back. So I, 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 I appreciate the gesture, but it's quite hollow. Go ahead, George. Yes, um, the article was interesting. And uh, to be fair, it, was, it appeared in the American Conservative, which has generally been fairly sensible on US-Russian relations over the years. However, the problem arises that in the United States, there really isn't any uh, party or even any uh, group of people uh, who actively want to um, improve relations between the United States and Russia. Now, there was uh, an open letter published in Politico about a week or so ago with a number of foreign policy uh, doyens who uh, said, well, I think it's a, a dangerous business, you know, having no relations with Russia. And so they cautiously uh, urged some kind of diplomacy and negotiations um, with Russia and saying this is not a good idea, having no relations. Uh, and then within a few days, there was a ferocious attack also in the pages of Politico by another bunch of foreign policy uh, doyens uh, who said, no, 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 absolutely no reset, no improvement yeah. of relations with Russia until Russia does this, 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 this and this. And then yeah. we might consider uh, an improvement of relations. So. This is why it's, it's really very, very hard to get anywhere on this. Yeah, Glenn, you know, it was Daniel Larson that wrote the article uh, in, uh, in, the, in the American Conservative. And like I said, I largely agree with him. Um, he's, a, he's a realist, non-interventionist. He believes in restraint. That those are basically my stripes, too. But I thought it was really interesting that he was quoting uh, Angela Stent, which is, you know, within foreign policy circles, she's considered a Russia hand, an old Russian hand. And, but when you, she's in the realm of mainstream media, she's a super, super hawk, okay? And I, I found it to be quite jarring that, you know, she's being look, looked to as some kind of authority in how to deal with us russia relations. But when CNN wants to talk to her or MSNBC, she's just with the rest of the Russia gators. At least that's my impression here. So, you know, even there, there seems to be such a cleavage with serious people saying, well, yeah, we kind of need it. It's difficult to get there. Then those are saying it's appeasement, which most people don't even know what the historical reference of appeasement is, but it must be bad. Go ahead, Glenn. Yeah, and you would think now that uh, all the international uh, agreements are collapsing, uh, arms races around the corner, relations keeps uh, plummeting, uh, that we want, would want to improve relations, especially after the Russia gate proved to be a hoax. Uh, so it is interesting to explore why there hasn't been more diplomacy. And I think yeah, George very yeah, correctly touched on it, what, what, what diplomacy now means. It's become a reward. And it's important to understand how it became like this, because diplomacy is imperative to increase mutual understanding, to reach compromises over these competing security interests. Otherwise, you only have what we have now, conflict and war. However, we all see that diplomacy begins to die when states start to define their concepts, or sorry, define their conflicts in the, in the international system as being good versus evil, uh, as opposed to being competing interests. And this is the Manichaean worldview that's becoming more and more dominant, where compromise is appeasement, and 
peace is not achieved by reaching a compromise with the other side, but rather you need to vanquish evil. So again, this winner takes all uh, full victory. Now, I think we also have to recognize why the West uh, has some vulnerability to this Manichaeanism. It's because we do define ourselves, uh, the West, that is, uh, by shared values. And, and that's why our interest is only expressed in the language of values. So we don't even discuss Russian security interests anymore. We just discuss how their, their belligerent intentions and the world is depicted in this very Harry Potter theme as, again, good versus evil. And that's why when you speak to Russia, we don't talk about the compromise. No, cooperation now means it's a pedagogic instrument. So we will talk to Russia once they do this and this and this and they fall in line. But, you know, diplomacy is not the reward. It's supposed to be the tool to reach this agreement. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so, but now we, we speak of rewarding Russia with, by talking to it. If it does what we want, we have to punish its bad behavior, suggesting that, you know, we are the righteous ones. So uh, diplomacy usually does not survive well uh, when we do this uh, very Manichaean view of the world. Yeah, George, you know, it, 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 Russia is, is an object. It's being talked at all of the time. It is not being engaged. And the, what is really um, um, disappointing is that like, the Open Skies uh, Treaty, the, the uh, START II Treaty, uh, other treaties, that, that, that has nothing to do with virtue of the, your interlocutor. It has to do with security. So I don't know what, what, where's the virtue in this except for maybe saving humanity from a catastrophe. Um, it, you know, I guess I'm going to date myself, but, you know, the evil empire, the Soviet Union, well, Ronald Reagan went to Moscow and signed agreements, okay? We, uh, during the Second World War, there was Lend-Lease, so we gave all those evil communist money and spank, uh, uh, cans of spam, okay? I mean, why? Because it was practical, it was in mutual interest, it was, it was part of your defined national security. I mean, like, we can't even get to that point right now, because you have to, you have to um, um, surrender and you have to uh, capitulate, and then we'll talk to you. That, saying, that is not the way that traditionally it works. No, that, that's exactly right. And, that, and of course, if you uh, go back uh, a little bit earlier, uh, into the, the heyday of détente, the, which was the uh, late 1960s and early 1970s, um, very important arms control agreements were signed between um, the United States and the Soviet Union. Historic agreements, which was the ABM Treaty and then the various uh, Seoul Treaties. And remember, at that time, this was just a few years after the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, so that was a, which was a, a big event. Yet only five years later, there was Brezhnev on the White House lawn hugging uh, Richard Nixon, the arch anti-communist. And, and we now, should add, George, and George, we should also add is that the Soviet Union was a major contributor to North Vietnam during that conflict. And in that aid, I think you can clearly uh, make the claim that that aid helped in, um, kill American lives that were in the country in the South. So, I mean, even in a semi-hot war, they were sitting down and signing agreements, okay? But that's, exactly that's, that's, that's impossible today. That it's, it, it is impossible, in which, uh, you know, these, uh, as in that uh, Politico uh, letter, the, the response to the original letter, they went through again a litany of complaints. Oh, Russia's done this, look at Georgia, you could Ukraine, or Crimea, Syria, uh, Afghanistan, you know, just go litany of whining and complaining. And you think, well, you know, some years ago, Americans were able actually to put these things behind them and say, well, there is a mutual uh, necessity to sign major agreements. Whatever uh, disagreements we may have on this or that, you know, there's no point in rehashing, you know, Czechoslovakia or Poland or who did what at Yalta. You know, there's something more urgent uh, right now, which is, you know, essentially the survival of humanity. And so at that moment, Americans were able to understand this, but that's just simply completely gone out of the window ever since the uh, the unipolar moment began in 1991. You know, Glenn, the, again, when I look at the tone and tenor of these articles, the one from Politico and others, even Larson's uh, piece here, it, it, it assumes that the Russians want the same thing as the Americans want, which is not necessarily true. I mean, the, the Russian side would say, well, you know, the START II agreement's a good agreement for us and for you, so why don't we keep it? Um, the Open Skies Treaty, 
was good for you and it was good for, for, for us. Why don't we keep it? But I mean, other than that, I mean, when they talk about these shared values, I'm sorry, I can't help but start laughing. So the illegal invasion and occupation of Iraq, the, the, the using United Nations Security Council resolutions to destroy Libya, uh, uh, having unilateral sanctions against uh, 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 Venezuela that are clearly a breach of international law. So, you know, from, uh, from lo you know, looking at the people thinking in the Kremlin, I mean, values, what values are you talking about? That is that that should not be part of the conversation. What should be part of the conversation is we can do X, Y, and Z that benefit both of us, but we don't have to be friends. That's how rational great powers usually behave. Go ahead, Glenn. Well, I think the first step in before you begin to move towards uh, compromises, you have to recognize that there are, uh, you know, you have to use a common language to define uh, the problem. However, the problem we see now has been this uh, deconstruction of the language. So we don't even have the same words for things. So, for example, when the West uh, intervened in Ukraine, helped to topple Yanukovych, uh, this went under uh, the uh, the sloganeering of European integration. It doesn't interfere, so that's European integration. When Russia tries to uh, improve its relations with its neighbors, it's imperialism or spheres of influence. So we use these terms, and you know the West cannot have a sphere of influence, even though it demands uh, you know influence in every corner. Uh, meanwhile, Russia does not have any legitimate space for any um, legitimate space for any influence beyond its own borders. So we essentially, because we have set up this system now after the Cold War, uh, we don't anymore really have any common language anymore. And this is, uh, yeah, very problematic. We see the same now with the conflict, uh, well, with the protest in Belarus. That is, uh, you know, on one hand we're saying, listen, uh, we have to be careful, the Russians don't interfere. And then in the next sentence, uh, we have to explain how, well, this, uh, we have to take advantage of the situation to sever Belarus from Russia. So. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be a contradiction there, because uh, when we do it, it's virtuous, and for European integration, we're spreading benign norms. So when the Russians do it, it's imperialism, it's dreaming of greater Europe, it's, uh, or it's attributed to one of uh, Putin's very evil personal characteristics. So it's, uh, it's very difficult to have any diplomacy to begin with when we already uh, deconstructed a common language to begin with. You know, you know, George, let's wrap it up here on this here. The, the, there is this recognition that, uh, and, and this is what was in the political article, is that uh, Russia isn't isolated. What we're doing isn't working. Um, and so there, at least there is a recognition of that. I don't know if that's going to be the tipping point for them to sit down and talk like adults instead of behaving like children like they have during the polar moment. Wrap it up for us, George. Go ahead. Yes, that's a very important point because... Um, Russia really isn't some uh, you know piddly little country that you can just isolate and uh, impose sanctions on and uh, force them to submit. Yeah, if you look at the GDP of Russia, um, according to purchasing power parity, Russia is about number six. It's a number six economy. It's a major economy. You're not just going to bring it to its knees. And uh, as far as its diplomacy is concerned, yes, many many countries don't. See at all in the way that um, uh, the United States and some of its uh, NATO allies see it. You know, they, they see Russia as a, a reliable, uh, civilized trading partner. And what that has no distinctive uh, national interest, that perhaps it should legitimately be when, when all these um, uh, U.S. policymakers talk about the international community, no, the international community is just the United States and NATO partners. Even within NATO, there's not really an agreement. I mean, really, the U.S. and the U.K. Um, so, yeah, but the countries simply don't share that view of Russia. They're much more positive than Russia. Okay, I, on that point, we're going to leave it. I, I appreciate you both being here on the gavel. Uh, everyone remember to like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you all soon.